This morning we want to expository, expositorily look at this topic um, this morning of Psalm chapter 2 and God's rule and reign in his kingdom, God's rule and reign over all of the earth. We have been going through the last couple of years of a lot of um, turmoil politically, um, not only in the United States, but even around the world. There's a fair amount of instability. Um, some things, you know, going quite well with the economy and some things like that. There's some, some good things happening, but there's also a lot of strife and a lot of hardship and a lot of finger pointing, a lot of trouble um, when it comes to this. And um, there's a, a growing uncertainty of how things look in the future. Um, now, this has often been the case. I want to say to you that throughout Christian history, and in fact, we can even look before the New Testament was finished, the letters that were being written, that there is great evidence in First and Second Thessalonians and First and Second Peter that there was great uncertainty about the, what was going to be in the future. Christians have always looked at the future as all peoples of the earth with a fair amount of uncertainty. And Christians are asking the questions, well, what about those who have died? When will they be raised? And what about the, those who are coming toward us and those who are bringing persecution upon us? What, how are we to look at this as being God's children in knowing God? Well, this morning we, we want to look and we want to see um, and pull back the curtain just a little bit into the scene in heaven and into the perspective of God when it comes to the kingdoms of this earthly life. And I believe that this message will be both convicting and I believe it will be calibrating. What do I mean by that? Except we need an adjustment here. But it will also be perhaps incredibly encouraging to believers here this morning. I want to pray before we read Psalm 2 and then we will read the passage and then we will look at the background of it. Um, and launch through a few observations from it, and I think some things that will be encouraging. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we are about to read your words. And without question, when we come to your words, this is the most important thing that could ever be said. Lord, you do not run on the opinions of man or, Lord, the thoughts of man. Lord, you have called us to look to, Lord, your thoughts and your wisdom and your words of truth. And so, Father, I pray that this morning that we would do just that, that we would allow your word to find the mark in our hearts. We pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us through your word this morning and that we would come more and more into conformity with Christ in your grand plan, that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done in us and in our places as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Notice with me Psalm chapter 2. Psalm 2, um, and I begin in verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying... Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Verse 4, he who sits in the heavens laughs, and the Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. It's amazing to me how God's word is so very applicable to our daily lives. Words that are written over 3,000 years ago, 
so beautifully ready for us here this morning in 2018. Now, as the background that I chose was, yes, indeed, the idea of nations. You think of the European Union, that's part of the blue that is there, but didn't want to leave out the other grand nations of the earth as we look at conflicts all around the world and we look at all of these issues. And we're going to see that it's not just about geopolitical conflicts and it's not just about nations when it comes to uh, political groups of people and, and where they live, but it's going to be much wider than that. Let's look and let's see the background of Psalm chapter 2. Fill these things in, take your pen, and follow along with me. One, I want us to see, and especially for those who, of you who are new to studying the Bible, the Psalms are really, the word Psalms really means songs. So these are the songs of the Old Testament. These are the poetry of the Old Testament. In fact, that's the number two. I want you to see this with me. Hebrew, the Hebrew name for the book of Psalms, Telium, is this, which literally translated means this, praises. So in the Old Testament, um, if you were in Hebrew, the literal uh, way that you would say the book of Psalms is praises. It's the praises to God. Number three, this is a collection of poems that are meant to be sung or recited or prayed. So this is poetry, Hebrew poetry. You know, so the, many have said the highest form of art is poetry. It's the idea of concepts, not mere images, but concepts that bring about images and that bring about the movement of the heart and the emotion. And so we come to this picture of truth in the form of poems all lifting up and heading toward praise to God. This is a very, very important part of God's Word. Look at number four. The Psalms exalt a few things. They exalt or they illuminate the Torah and the Messiah. They illuminate God's Word, God's truth, God's way, and the one who has come to save us. So the Torah that shows us our need for God and who God is but also the Messiah who opens the door for the Torah to be fulfilled, for the law to be fulfilled. Also, you see there, lament and praise. Um, there are many of the Psalms that are the lamentations, the expression of pain and suffering and grief and question. Many of you have found great solace in the Psalms when you are going through a difficult time um, you look and you see where others, the people of God, have also suffered, and you have found faith and help as you look at the laments or even the praises of the Psalms. And here we find the way to have faith and hope. We see that there is a, there is a belief upon God, a running to God in faith, in finding security and help and hope in God. So these are common themes that the Psalms show us, Torah and Messiah being one of the key ones that we see in this passage that we're about to study. Now, Psalm 1 that comes immediately before the book of Psalms, these two Psalms, Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, are really the intro for the rest of the 150 Psalms that are given. And Psalm 1 is beautiful as it contrasts the righteous who delight in the Torah, or the righteous who delight in the teachings of God, and the wicked who do not. Um, in fact, if you have your Bible, you may want to look at it there for a moment with me. Look at Psalm chapter 1. I want you to see this contrast. It runs back and forth all the way through. Um, so you have your Bible open. Look with me in Psalm 1. It says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scoffers. Look at verse 2. But his delight is in what? The law of the Lord. This is in the words of God. His delight is in God's truth. Not in all of the things that the world is showing. Not in the things of the wicked and the sinners and the scoffers. Look at verse 2, and in his law he meditates day and night. And look at the blessings that come from delighting in God's truth. Look at verse 3, he will be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water, 
which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. Here's the idea. A seed is being carried along by a river, and that seed is implanted somewhere there along the side of the river. And because it's by the river, it has the source of nutrients and water that it needs. When drought comes, because it's close to the water source, that tree thrives. So it grows up strong, it's beautiful, and in the right season, that that tree bears its fruit. Why? Because it's close to the source of life. It's close to the, and that's the same thing for the person, for the individual who comes to the righteousness of Christ and sees the goodness of who Christ is that made righteous in Christ. As we look to the goodness of God, we rejoice in the truth of who God is, in all of the truth of Christ, and we prosper by his goodness, not necessarily in material things, though sometimes um, that is the case, but far greater greater than that is the prospering of true success in life through Christ. Look at number four. The wicked are not so, but they are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor the sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So here at the beginning of the Psalms, we see this great contrast of the righteous versus the wicked. Let me just say to you, that the only hope of righteousness for anyone on the earth, Old Testament or New Testament, is the Messiah. Jesus is the only hope that any one of us would ever be righteous. There is no righteousness apart from Jesus. So Psalm 1 is really about Jesus in his righteousness versus the wickedness of the world. If anyone says, well, you know, it's about us being good and loving the things of God. Well, the only way that we can be good and the only way that we can love the things of God is because Christ has shed his light in our hearts, in our wicked, selfish, depraved hearts. The only hope that we have is that the voice of God has called us to himself. He's given us the gift of faith and repentance, and we turn to him in faith, and he has rained down upon us his salvation all through the Messiah. And so here in Psalm 1, we see this great contrast between the individual that is found in Christ, found in righteousness, versus the one who loves the world's way and loves the wickedness of the world. We see this great dichotomy between those two. But Psalm 2 brings us to looking at the nations, So it's not just the individuals, but it's the nations of the world and those who pursue God and those who do not. And again, it's more than the geopolitical things. We could could have different flags. You could have the Persians and the Romans and the Arab nations and the Mongols and the British Empire. There's different empires. We, we, We see our own flags of this present day, but God's word is timeless. And um, we, we, we see throughout history that there is this picture of the nations raging against the grand and glorious plan of God. Look at Psalm 2 underneath number 6 under the background there. Psalm 2 warns the nations that the righteous and reigning Messiah King is coming. The righteous and reigning Messiah King is coming. And I want us to see this morning, Sheridan Hills, that as we look at what's happening in the world around us, we need Psalm 2 on our minds. As we go into a week of elections, as we go into whatever the future holds in the days ahead, that we would firmly have the truth of God in the grand picture of God's plan on our minds and our hearts that there is a Messiah King and he is coming. He is coming to judge the earth, and he is coming to redeem his people. Um, Notice this with me in verse 1. I I want us to see verses 1, 2, and 3. It says, why do the nations rage and the people's plot, underline it, in vain? So it's nations as a group, peoples as as other groups, peoples as in plural, so it's the ethnos of the world, all of the different types of people of the world, and even the nations of the world, and, but they're, they're doing this, and notice that the whole psalm begins with a question, and what is the question asking? Why are they doing this? And now the answer comes. Look at the answer to why do the nations rage? Why do the peoples plot in vain? Look at verse 2. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. And what, where are they going with it? 
against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Here is the oldest problem all the way along the, the uh, progress of human history. From Adam and Eve standing before the tree of life, all the way through, we see that the sinful human heart is saying, let me be me and let me do what I want to do. Let me burst off God's parameters. Let me burst off his safety checks around me. I know better than him. We see that this is what the serpent did as he tempted with this idea of, did God really say this? And he knows that if you do this, that you'll be able to tell the difference between this. And, and so he is there lying, putting words in God's mouth. He's slandering the things that God has said. And he's even promising things that he really can't promise as he is there deceiving at the very beginning. And here we see that this runs right on through to our present day, that we are plotting against, we are rejecting the Lord's picture. So notice this and fill it in. Notice that the nations rage because they rebel against the authority of God over their lives. This is what is happening. What we see through history and what we see presently is the peoples of the world rebelling against the authority of God, saying, I don't want authority. In fact, we live in a day increasingly where, where the idea of authority is a negative thing. And we live in a time um, since the 60s, and it's, it's taken off from, since the 60s into the 70s and 80s, where you know, the whole idea that authority is to be questioned, authority is very often bad, and there's no doubt that there's abuses of authorities. We, we recognize that through every age, there's great abuse of authority. But where we come to the place of wanting to throw off all authority, in fact, the French Revolution was all about throwing off the, throw off the rulership of God and king. We want neither one. That was the idea um, of the French Revolution. Um, the American Revolution was a little bit different, but there's largely this idea of throwing off authority, and we see this. Notice here with me in verse 1. In verse 1, we see, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? You see, this is not limited to geopolitical nations. This is not merely the, the Americans and the Chinese and the Russians and the Indians not getting along with one another. This is not just about geopolitical. But let's think about some other ways in which people groups rage, in which people groups have other authorities. How about the whole world of electronic media? How about the whole world of this idea of our electronic digital lives? Whether it be Facebook or whether it be whatever, we, we just have views into culture, we have views into one another's lives that are, that are just constant. And so the messages of the world are constantly hitting us in, in great volume. And by volume I mean not only in loudness, but I also mean in amount. So we, we have the, the nation of the world, the worldliness of the world coming and inundating us. Sure, in this week, we, we think about a donkey and an elephant. And, um, you know, this is kind of funny to us, you know, why either party would want to be associated with either one of those images. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but we see this great conflict that is there. And we, we see the nation's rage within political parties there. How about this, different ideologies that are very, very foundational to the fabric of our society. When we start looking at the issue of the LGBTQ movement and the, the redefinition of marriage, the changing of the look of the most basic human institution that we have, designed by God, by the way, so beautifully constructed in the us, not only biologically, but also relationally and what he has designed, we, we see that the, the culture, and not only the culture of the United States, but the culture of the world raging against God's design and his pictures on that. In fact, some of you are new to us and you have questions about that. I want to say to you that in the bookstore, you can pick up sermon sets of, of the notes of five messages that our church did on the issue of the meaning of marriage. 
And because that's such a hot topic, it cannot be ignored in a message like this when we're talking about raging against God and his design and his plan. It's very appropriate for us to mention that, but also to say to you that there are resources that go into great depth of that in the bookstore, and those are free. You can just go by and pick those up that are there. How about other areas of our lives that seem to be whole kingdoms? whole kingdoms that distract. Sports would be one of those, right, for some people. Um, for some people, it would be a different kind of sports. For some people, we would need a fishing rod and a shrimp or a, a lure on here um, or a hunting uh, rifle or something like that. For others, it would be some other area of life that gets much of our attention, our hobbies and our, and our other things. And so all of these things can come and actually occupy our minds and draw us away from the things that are truly important to God. So it's not limited, we've already filled that in verse 1, or in verse 1 we see, it's not limited to geopolitical nations. Um, in fact, when you say the peoples, that's talking about the people, not just the rulers, but also the individuals. Look at number 2. In verse 2, we see this. Look at verse 2. It says, The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel, what? Together. About one of you or two of you said that with me. Look at verse 2. Let's read verse 2 out loud together. The kings of the earth... Okay, that's not all of you. Here we go. Verse 2. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together. Okay, so they're taking counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Look at verse 2 out there to the side. You see, this is not passive, but active rebellion. This is not, oh, I guess I didn't know. This is, no, this is kind of clear to us, but we are doing our own thing. And that's what the Scripture tells us is happening in the hearts of men and of women all around the world as the, as the nations say, let's throw off. And let's look and see this. In verse 2, it says also that they take counsel against the Lord and against His anointed. Now, this passage is coming from 1 Samuel chapter 7, and there's part of a picture here that looks at David and Solomon but we also see, as many times throughout the Scripture, we see the messianic picture of this all the way through, from a type to an anti-type, as some would say. But here we see that this is so clearly the picture of the Lord and His anointed. This is the Father and the Son. That the Father and the Son is coming together in order to bring about His kingdom and His salvation upon the earth and here the nations will have no part of it, they reject that. And so look what it is that they say in verse 3. Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. You see, they, they act, they foolishly reject safe rule. That's what they do. They foolishly reject what God is doing. They're saying, Take this off of me. I don't want this on me. Let me be. Let me do my own thing. As I was preparing this message, I thought about um, my mother and my father when I was about four or five years old. Somewhere around four or five years of age, um, back in the early 1970s, um, seat belts went from being just a lap belt to being what? Lap belt along with shoulder belt. How many of you remember cars with just a lap belt? It was just a lap belt. See, all of us that are, you know, a little bit older. Some of you young people are saying, what are you talking about? What do you mean? Well, there are some people in this room, guys, guys and gals, you're going to be shocked at this. They remember when there were no seat belts in cars. In fact, you're going to be shocked at this. Um, the, the huge motor companies in Detroit for over a decade said we, even though the statistics show that cars are much safer with seatbelts, if we put seatbelts in the car, that will communicate that our car that we're trying to sell is unsafe. Um, so they wouldn't put seatbelts in cars for a long time. But finally, they put seatbelts in cars. They were just a lap belt, which can cause many injuries in themselves without the shoulder harness. But I remember when my mom and dad bought a car with a seatbelt that had a shoulder harness, and they started putting that on me. Now, what did I typically do? 
I don't want that on me, it's hot, and, you know, and everything else. And <clears throat> as a child, I would just rebel against that. As a child, I would say, take that thing off of me. I don't want that thing on me. But then, as, as you and I both know, as we look at in this present modern day, that's incredibly dangerous to be in a car without a seatbelt. The laws of physics take over when the car starts rapidly stopping. And all kinds of injury comes when a seatbelt is not worn. It, it brings great harm to us. And so it, it's kind of like this picture. There's this picture that the world is saying like a toddler, take that thing off of me. I don't want that thing on me. I know better when in fact it's not the case at all and we, we are headed for certain destruction if something like this occurs in this. So look at verse 4 with me and look at the next section. Even though the, the world is rebelling in verse 3 and saying, let this all be, a, you know, cast away our cords, we can be done with this. Look at verse 4. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. The next section I want you to notice here is that the Lord's supreme dominance and even mockery of the wicked that gives way to his terrifying presence. We see this in this passage, that the Lord is high and exalted in heaven. He is supremely dominating. There is no competition in his glory. There is no competition in his power and in his might. Yet the world just rebels. Look at verse 4. He sits in the heavens and he laughs, and he holds them in derision. The word derision, that means mockery. The Lord even taunts them and mocks at them. I was thinking about this this week, how to, how to think about, the, about God and his grandeur. And here's one of the things that I read from one of the commentators, J.C. Ryle wrote over 150 years ago. He said, imagine this. Imagine a fly attacking an elephant. <clears throat> How much success is a fly going to have in attacking an elephant? An elephant whose skin is in some places over a half inch thick. I mean, we're, we're talking about this huge beast and a, and a fly that, that weighs an infinitesimal amount coming and saying, I'm going to bring this elephant down. I mean, we, we look at that and we think how foolish, how stupid that would be. He would also write this. He said, or imagine a man trying to snatch the sun out of the heavens. Imagine a man grasping and reaching for the sun as if to snatch it out of the heavens. That is the picture of God's grand glory over us. It's much better than the, the first image that I have of little Noah Nister. Um, coming after his dad. Have you ever done this with a toddler? You know, the little toddler, he's, he's playing with you or he's mad at you and he comes at you and you just put your hand out there in front of him and you have a hold of his head and he's swinging for all he's worth. You know, he's, he's trying to get you and you're just sitting there going, what did you say? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, as the child is just there fomenting, doing his thing. You see, the dominance of heaven, the dominance of God in his heaven is truly able to make a mockery of the wicked and their raging against God until the laughter stops and the judgment begins. Notice what it says here in verse 4. It says, he who sits in the heavens laughs, he holds them in derision, then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion my holy hill. You see, in verse 4, we see this is from the heavens, but in verse 5 and 6, we see his throne in Zion. He comes to us. He comes to us in both judgment and salvation. And it's his coming to us that brings about his terrifying presence. Now, there's many people who have an image and an idea of the Lord Jesus as a long-haired 1960s or 70s looking fellow um, running around in a toga and rather effeminate and not very strong. But my friends, that is not at all the picture of the Messiah King. The, Maya, the Messiah King is a warrior and the Bible says that he will come to us with his garments dripping with the blood of his enemies. 
I mean, it is, a, it is a very real judgment that he will bring, a very real judgment that we see of God always against sin, of God always against the wicked. And in case you're sitting there wondering, well, these people think, wow, great, go get them, God, we're part of the righteous, and go get the wicked, and so forth. Listen, there would be no hope for us to escape that awesome judgment due to any merit of our own. It is only by the grace of God as seen in the sacrifice of Jesus, in his calling us to repentance to him, his calling us to submission to him as him being the Messiah King that we find any hope and solace. And in fact, we find every hope and solace there. So he comes to us and he sets up his throne on his holy hill. Notice the next part that we see here, and we see it in verse 7. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession." You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Here's part of the picture that we see here. We see a dialogue possibly between father and son, the holy father, creator of all things, the holy son, creator of all things. And within the Trinity, we see this dialogue of the perfect unity of God's plan to bring judgment and salvation to the earth. We see that he is coming, and he's saying in this, he's coming to rule and to judge and to save. If you haven't already filled it in there, see that the Father is giving the Son all authority and power. In fact, Jesus would say these words, all authority upon heaven and earth has been given to me. So, and then he commissions us to go and make disciples. And so this is that picture of God giving the authority to the Son for this grand and glorious perfect, perfect harmony within the Trinity in his grand plan to save a lost and dying world. So he's ruling, he's judging, he's saving. Look in verse 8, we notice his salvation. This is the beautiful hope. Look at verse 8, it says, Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Jesus himself would say, no one, comes to the, no one comes to me unless the Father brings them, unless the Father gives them to me. We see numerous promises throughout the Gospels that God is giving to the Messiah his people. God is giving them to those who will have faith in those who will trust in him. So there's this beautiful picture of God's salvation being given. But we also see in verse 9, when it comes to the rebellious nations in verse 9, we see that you shall break them with a rod of iron. Um, Some translations will say rule them. You will rule them with a rod of iron. But both both can be translated here. And dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. It's like a piece of clay, a piece of clay pottery. And you imagine it being thrown down on the ground with force, and it's turned into a thousand pieces or ten thousand pieces. We see that this is the grand and glorious fury of God's wrath against a wicked people who say, who say, throw off his cords from us. We don't want his parameters. We don't want his way. Now, in verse 10, 11, and 12, we see this call to heed the Psalm 2 warning. This is a call for you and for me to heed this grand and glorious warnings. Look what it says in verse 10. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. You say, well, I'm not a king. Is this really for me? Well, part of the picture here is it says also, O rulers of the earth. In fact, you live in a democracy, you say, yeah, I'm just, I'm just a citizen in a democracy. Well, in a true democracy, in a representative democracy, who is to rule over the will of what happens in our laws and in our land? The people. So there's a way in which you can look at this and say, wow, this is talking about me. Because you see, as a nation votes, it goes. And so here we are privileged to live in a land where we participate in the rulership of the land, and really the rule of the people is the idea behind the Constitution. 
And so we, in effect, rule within our society as the people in a democracy. Here is this picture. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Look what it says in verse 11. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish in the way, for His wrath is quickly kindled. I want you to see this. You see, we are called to heed the warning. If you haven't already filled that in, fill that in. Heed the Psalm 2 warning. In verse 11, we see Christ's glory. Here it says, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. This is the the beautiful picture that we, though we have a fierce and awesome God, because of the grace of the Son and the Father giving people to the Son for whom He saves, we can rejoice in His coming. We can be glad in His arrival. We can, be joyce in, we can rejoice in His righteousness. We can praise Him in His goodness and in His grace. But we do that out of respect and an awesome reverence for him. That's what it means here to serve the Lord with fear. It means recognize him properly as who he is. Rejoice with trembling. It is to look at the great and close call that we had in our sin that God has delivered us to by his righteousness. You see, in verse, 11, in verse 12, we see and fill this in that we need to recognize Christ as Messiah King. We need to recognize that this is the one who comes and saves us. Look at verse 12, kiss the Son. What does that mean, kiss the Son? Kiss the Son is a, is a throwback to rulership and religious rulership as well as sometimes political rulership in the ancient kingdoms. When a king was a ruler over a certain domain and people came into that domain, in order not to be seen as enemies of the king, they would come and pay homage to the king. They would come and they would respect the king. And as a symbol of their respect to him, as he would come, they would come and he would often wear a ring that would be his stamp of authority. It would be the sign of his authority through decrees that would be sent out from his throne. And so those people, they would come and they, and a show of submission to the king, they would kiss his ring. You say, well, yeah, that's, that's what we've heard about with the pope um, and so forth. Well, the pope isn't the one that started that. Long before the pope was ever conceived of, um, we see this idea throughout even Old Testament history. In fact, that's where it would have come from that a submission, a show of submission to the king. And so there is this picture. Look what it says, kiss the sun. You know, I I also find it interesting and um, rather somewhat alarming when I think about Judas Iscariot. How did he betray the Lord? He betrayed the Lord with an act of affection and submission. And so before we think only of the wicked, before we place all of that category on something that we think it doesn't really apply to us, look at me, look at what I'm doing, I think that this, as we look through the New Testament and as we see the grand story, that there are some people that are very, very religious who even are going through motions of showing affection that within their heart, that no one around them except the Lord himself knows the real story. And so, you know, Judas's work in that, on that night of betrayal wasn't the first time of his betrayal. He had been meeting, he had been working. The Lord knew his heart from the start of what was going to happen. And yet the Lord, in his grand and sovereign plan, Judas is allowed to continue, and God is working even through these things. So there's so many lessons that can come from this. Number one, we can recognize that we can be very religious, and we can even appear to kiss the sun, and yet our hearts be far from him. You see, you confess me with your lips, Jesus said, 
but your heart is far from me. In starting point, the last two Sundays, we've talked about the fact that some people are going to miss heaven by 18 inches. What a shame to get so close and yet miss heaven by 18 inches. You say, what do, what do you mean? Oh, well, they have the head knowledge of who God is and what God has done, even in sending Christ. But when we really look, and if you had the view of God down into their heart, you see that he does not own their heart. He does not own who they really are. Oh, there is an effort of kiss the sun in public. The lips profess, but the heart is far away from God. I believe that we would do well to consider this and to say, Lord, is my heart yours? Am I really yours? Is this a charade that I'm playing, or is, are you really the king of my heart? This is an important question that Christians should always be willing to ask. The Bible tells us that we are to test ourselves to see if we are in the faith. And that is played out in whether or not we are obedient to him when it comes to the evidence of that fact. So it says in verse 12, kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way. So we see his coming wrath and we see that his wrath is coming soon. The other way to say for his wrath is quickly kindled, it doesn't mean that he's, he's just ready to go off. It doesn't mean that he is some temperamental Um, unpredictable one, though in some cases C.S. Lewis would say, you better not think that God is safe. Um, He is not safe, but he is good. And here we see that his wrath is coming soon. How do we apply this? I want to give you some very quick applications. I find great challenge, I find great encouragement in Psalm 2. I think that one of the first ways that we can apply this entire passage is, number one, to recognize that this present world rages against God in every imaginable way. This present world is raging against God. What you see on the news and what you hear in all of the debates and what you see in the conflicts between ideas and between people and between kingdoms and between points of view and between nations and between countries, what you see between ideologies, all of this is the rage against God. All the, notice this, all the strife, all the division, anger, self-righteousness, and that's a very big one. There's many who would say, oh, well, I think this, so I'm on, I have the moral ground that's higher than your ground. And, and, and the picture isn't who's necessarily right, but the idea of who is projecting self-righteousness, all of the ugliness. My grandmother used to talk about, don't be ugly, don't be ugly. Some of you are from the South and you know that phrase, don't be ugly, don't, don't, don't show ugliness that idea of being, being unkind and being, being cruel, lying, accusing, slandering, selfishness, greed, fear, materialism, sexual immorality, obsession with entertainment, indecency. I mean, the, the amazing amount, of just if you just looked at indecency, the things that are not decent, the things that are profane, not just talking about curse words, but <clears throat> all of the profanities of life, The vanity, the fakery, the oppression, the violence, the lawlessness, the irrationality, all of these pictures are the idea of raging against God in every imaginable way. I want you to see 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. This is amazing. This is this is so appropriate for us to read and to be constantly reminded of as a church. Paul writes to Timothy, and he says to him, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For pe- verse 2, for people will be lovers of what? Woo! Wow! Look at the next one. Lovers of money. Proud. Arrogant abusive, ah, disobedient to their parents. Do we not see this? Ungrateful, 
unholy, heartless, unappeasable. That means they just can't be satisfied. Slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness. Didn't we just talk about that? But denying its power. Avoid such people. You see, friends, if that passage doesn't show us that we're in the last days, I don't know what does. And these have been the last days for the last 2,000 years. You can read Matthew chapter 24 to see what the last of the last days will look like. That picture isn't too far off from where we are as well. Friends, Isaiah 5.20, about four years ago, came to my attention as I started to see that when you uphold the design and the plan of God concerning marriage, and you say, hey, this is what God says, and this is good, this is what is right, it's amazing how Isaiah 5.20 begins to come into play as that is batted down and someone will call you actually evil for saying that. We see this here in Isaiah 5.20. Look what it says. Woe to those who call evil evil good and good evil. That is exactly what is happening on many issues, but especially the LGBTQ issue, the redefinition of marriage issue. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitterness. We are called to say God's word is good and God's plan is good and his love is good and we love a world that is rejecting him. We don't hate the world that is rejecting him. We are not, we are not persecuting the world that is rejecting him. We come to them and say, no, there is a God whose salvation is good and he offers his goodness to you. You see, that is a loving thing to say. That is a loving thing to do. And when you have someone that is around you that is, that is headed down the road that leads away from God, the loving thing to do is to lovingly, gently, carefully, productively say to them that there is a God who loves you and he has a way that is right. You see, that is a loving thing. It would be unloving to ignore them in their folly, to let them run down the road of their rebellion without knowing that there is indeed a God who calls them to himself. Look at number two. There's a second way. Not only, not only do we need to recognize that this present world rages against God, but number two, and this is going to be hard for some of you, hard for me, recognize that America is one of the nations that most rages against God. How many of you do not like that one? I don't like that one. I'm letting you know I don't like that one. But I believe that it's true. America is what you say, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Pastor. Some ask, but aren't we more honoring to God than other less godly nations? Well, first of all, let me just say this. If we are, it's not because we think highly of ourselves. In fact, that goes in direct conflict to 2, Corinthians, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, that says, if my people who are called by my name will what? Humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will bring my blessing. You see, what we need to recognize is that America won't be experiencing God's blessings and his his help and his salvation in this if we're just proud about our righteousness. In fact, the Bible says just the opposite of that. But when you consider all of the ways in which we see America leading the way also in unrighteousness when it comes to technology and entertainment and so many other areas, friends, we have much as a society to repent of. I mean, when, 
when there are people all around the world that, that get all of their standards on entertainment and all of their standards on so many aspects of their lives because of the entertainment that we export, when they get all of their cues from us based upon things that are ungodly, my friends, there is no way to justify that. And there is no way to think highly of that. We as Americans, when it comes to those ungodliness and, and the, the, the settings of ungodliness in that that we export to the world, we should repent and pray for God's forgiveness. And I'm someone who thinks much of my country. I'm someone who loves my nation. I'm someone who, who cherishes what God has done through my nation, through the years, and, and the, the beautiful picture of His grace in so many ways on this great land. But friends, we cannot think highly of ourselves in regards to our wickedness in the ways in which we rage against God as well. My father has often said to me, son, if the shoe fits, wear it. And there are ways in which we need to wear this and ask for God's great forgiveness as we have raged against God and affected the world in that. How about number three? If Christ, how, how can Psalm 2 help us? If Christ is not your king, turn to him in repentance and faith. That is what the end of this psalm says to do. Look what it says there in verse 10, up there at the top of the page. In verse 10 it says, Now therefore, O kings, be wise and be warned. O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son. That means come to him and recognize him lest he be angry and you perish in the way. You see, you can turn to the Lord in repentance and faith. I love John 1.12. I'm going to ask you all to read it out loud with me. It's on your outline. I want you to see this. It's on, the, it's on the screen in front of you. Look what it says. Let's read it out loud. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You see, this is what makes you move from the land of the wicked into the land of the righteous. Those who receive Christ, those who turn to Him, who believe that He is the Messiah King, who come to Him and come to Him in reckless brokenness and say, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. These are the ones who find Christ as King. Number four, this is the one that I think that you can leave with great encouragement. I love it. We see in Psalm chapter two that number four is this. If Christ is your king, serve him, serve him faithfully and rejoice in his salvation. Let me tell you that Christians know, don't need to be the angriest in this country. Christians need to be the happiest in this country. You say, well, I'm heartbroken about what I see happening in so many aspects of our society. Well, listen, be heartbroken about that, but rejoice that Jesus is the one who can save anyone from anything. And if he has saved you from your millions of sin, you need to rejoice in that. We have something to be truly glad about. You know, this nation is not our ultimate citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven with God for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I want to challenge you to tell that to your heart and to tell that in all of your work. Now, in verse 4, it says, serve him faithfully. You know, I'm going to say to you that I believe that that also means vote. Vote faithfully. Vote biblically. Now, I, I know there's a bunch of turkeys on the ballot. And you, you got to take the least spoiled one in many ways, especially in relation to this book right here. I mean, this book needs to be the standard by which we seek who, who's going to stand closest to biblical values. Nothing wrong with us saying, Lord God, help me to vote. I'm not telling you to vote Republican or vote Democrat. I would never tell you that. I'm going to say you seek to be faithful before God as you vote. And you seek to be rejoicing in God's great salvation if you're a Christian. And if you don't have Christ as your king, 
Let him come this morning and rule over your heart. Let's pray together. Would you stand together as we pray?